This week on the 215, we visit the shops and check out the vibe of One Art Community Center. Meet craftsman and visual artist Galen Gibson Cornell. Get a felt and fat studio tour. And lastly, a 215 flashback favorite. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the 215. I'm Mike Jarek, and Breland will be back next week. I'm actually beyond the 215 right now. I'm in charming Collingswood, New Jersey at the Perkins Center for the Arts. Now, what is this place all about? I'll explain that later on in the show. But first, our first story. I'm gonna jump right back across the river to West Philly to an art oasis. We look out the window on 52nd Street. It's a rich culture and history here, but it's also got a lot of wounded souls here, you know, in the heart of West Philly. And so this space is intentionally here to raise the vibration of our community. One Art is a urban eco arts village of all black and brown businesses and community organizations centering marginalized people all over the world. I know y'all have a bunch of things going on on the campus. Just can you run through and just kind of tick off all the yeah, different things that okay. are happening <laughs> yes. on the One Arts campus? Definitely. We've got I and I Collective Holistic Artisan Boutique. She had the space. I had the creativity. We had this vision. It is a collective of folks in the tri-state area, but it's also a collective of the generations, the young and the old, that's kind of bridging that gap and you know having this one house space for it all. What is the importance in having a space like this. So I Not Collective is a safe space for folks to come into, you know, share their day, politic reason, try on beautiful clothing, you know, see examples of, you know, our people doing things, you know, uh, great things, creating amazing pieces, um, and just kind of validating us and affirming our creativity, our presence, our journey, our struggle, our triumphs. We have this big window here that um, we get to share what's inside, right? And a lot of folks come in here and they're just drawn to the energy. We've got planting people. What we like to do here is help people find plants that work for their lifestyle. There are many plants, especially easy ones like snake plants or spider plants that can actually help clean the air. And not only does it help clean the air, but it's nice to have something to take care of because when you take that time to water your plants, check on your plants, you're taking some downtime and it's almost like a meditative practice because you're not on your phone, you're not doing all these other things, you're just taking some time to look at the plants, take care of that need, their needs, which can also help remind you to take care of your own. When the plants are healthy, that means we are also healthy. We've got soon to be opening Spirit First Foods. Spirit First Foods is a universal spiritual law, which is everything happens in spirit first. And also the fact that everything is God. So when you're eating food, you're eating God. When you're drinking liquids, you're drinking God. When you breathe air, you're breathing God. So you're always in spirit. Vegan food, good vegan food, that's important to say, delicious vegan food is important because it nourishes your health and your well-being. And a lot of times you go to the doctors, you got diabetes, okay, where do you go to eat the foods that you need to eat? Well, if you come here, then you'll get beets, which is good for your diabetes. You'll get okra, which is good for your diabetes. You'll get an understanding of what you should and should not eat. Can you speak to how Spirit First fits into that the One Arts movement? They have I and I, which allows creative people to uh, sell their wares and express their creativity. They have plant people next door, which again is creator. Okay, they believe in composting, farming, all of the things that would come under spirit, as well as their general attitude and behavior is in line with uh, humanity. Cheers. Hey, good to see you again. You know, here in West Philly, that there are a lot of people struggling with a lot of things, you know, whatever kind of trauma that they're dealing with. Um, how does one art? play into helping them, like some of the things that you guys do here that play into helping people deal with 
that trauma and find a, a respite in this space? I mean, for instance, like all the chickens we got here and stuff, and the rabbit and the horse, when people come here, they just gravitate to that, and that they just, it just, they just feel, you know what I mean, love. There are community groups that meet here regularly. There are um, regular open mics. We've got We Love Philly with our high school youth program. Free music programs with Rock to the Future. Free film programs. This place allows us to be stable. It allows people to come and have an event without the fear of being insulted. To come someplace and just be able to totally Rest and relax is such a joy, and one art actually provides that. Isn't that place cool? If you want more info, go to their website, oneartcommunitycenter.com. Real simple. All right, I have a question for you. Do you think you could make art out of old, dilapidated street posters, like off of poles in the sides of buildings? Well, Galen can. I started playing music when I was a really little kid, like playing the viola at like age two and a half. And something in that process of having to practice and having to learn things even before I could say no or <laughs> you know, had other options, uh, something about that kind of made me a person that needs to express things creatively, I guess. I started drawing in middle school and loved it, and then I've been sort of chasing that feeling of a completed drawing sense. At a certain point for me, I studied art in school, and I, I found this idea of printmaking, which is like old ways of printing text and, and imagery. And that led me into sort of traveling, so I would go to another country and work in a print shop, uh, learning lithography or some old, uh, you know, interesting old methods of printing. And what I found out at that point was that these street posters that I was seeing on walls of different cities, those are prints. Those are actually the same kind of prints that I was making as an art student, but without the context. So my love of traveling, my love of this kind of printed poster ephemera kind of material, just sort of all spiraled together into the storm of whatever it is I am now. There's an artist that I really like, he's from Mexico, but his name's Gabriel um, Orozco. The thing I like about that guy is that he explores cities and then finds a very peculiar, very curious kind of thing to, to spend his attention on. So he's sort of like editing a city down to these certain moments where you start to think about the world in a bit bigger of, of scope. So that to me is super inspiring and that somehow like, I guess I would like to do something like that. Uh, but in my case, it's, it takes a bit more like handiwork, let's say. Art was like separate from life uh, when I was growing up, and I think that's true for most people, but at this point, I don't think there's any separation between art and ideas or art and life in a sense. I mean, I spend the majority of my hours of my life making art. I have this process of weaving posters. That's a structure that allows me then to start putting other ideas into that. So the new poster work that I'm doing, actually, I fold in my own kind of like thoughts and creativity and, you know, so it, it ends up being basically an outlet for whatever it is that's me. And I think that's the best way that I can describe art is that it's just a genuine, like, pretty uh, yeah, honest interpretation of whatever a person can give. I uh, went to a liberal arts college in Missouri called Truman State University, and then I went to the University of Wisconsin at Madison uh, for graduate school. That's like a, a highly ranked printmaking program, so I was studying printmaking at that time. And then after that, I, I went to, uh, I, I had a Fulbright Fellowship to Hungary, so I lived in Budapest. My time in Budapest was, I think, very foundational to what I'm doing now. I knew when I applied for this fellowship uh, that I wanted to work with street posters, because I, I had been there before to Budapest, and I saw that there were street posters covering a lot of walls in the city. And they were pretty dynamic, so they had something to do with what's going on in the city, like concerts and politics. I spent a whole year there, and my only job to me was to just walk around the city and take all this in. So I was photographing, I was collecting some posters, and, and just thinking about the whole environment. I think the thing that makes my work unique is the level to which I've pushed it. There are people in history that have made work with street posters and ripped street posters. There's a whole tradition of French and, and Italian like painters that work that way. I'd make some changes every, every with every new piece. So I would say that it's just 
it's gone, you know, further in a direction that only I could go. I think that's the best way to describe it. It's sort of like, I don't think anybody else would, <laughs> would care to or, <laughs> or could end up in the same, like, yeah, particular spot I'm in. It's hard to say how long the pieces take to make because a lot of that time is just germination. It's just coming up with the right idea about how to move forward. But let's say if I did have the right idea, I think I could do one of my larger portraits, which is 80 some inches by 50 inches. So like what, six, seven, seven feet by five feet or so. Could probably do that in two weeks of, of pretty heavy working. I think the ultimate goal is to make it to my deathbed uh, having supported myself making my artwork the whole way through. Check out his Instagram. It's Galen Gibson Cornell. All right. Oh, he also has a craft show coming up on November 3rd, 4th, and 5th at the Pennsylvania Convention Center. Check that out. Look what I did while you were watching that story. I made these little glass balls. Okay, I didn't, but you could learn how to do it here inside the classroom here at Perkins Center. So I guess you could call this a torch table. Can I call it a torch table? Yeah, these little torches. And then you make these like glass beads or whatever you want to make. Come and take a class. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to go to Kensington for some fantastic ceramic art. <laughs> here in Collingswood, New Jersey at the Perkins Center. Now, this ceramic art, all of it on these shelves here, made by the teachers here at the center. So you can tell they know what they're doing. So come and take a class. Uh, most of these items you can eat or drink out of. You know, you can eat on art. They prove it every day in Kensington. Felt & Fat is a ceramic design and manufacturing studio based here in Kensington, in Philadelphia. As a brand, you know, we are about design, we're about manufacturing, about making great product for people. Our work is designed for chefs uh, in professional settings, thus making it, like, even better at home. So how did you find yourself in the ceramics industry? Yeah, well, I kind of fell into this as a business. I was working at Fork. Chef Eli Colt had just moved to Philly. About a year in, Eli asked if I could make him plates. I, of course, said yes, and then promptly spent the next uh, you know, six to 12 months figuring out how to make a plate. Do y'all do all custom work, or do y'all do, you do some of both? So when we started out, everything was custom because we didn't have any designs. And so, you know, every chef who came to us, we started designing around their needs. So what makes the product that y'all create special? So we make very durable product. We choose to work with porcelain, which is uh, about as durable a clay as you can work with. So this is porcelain? So this is porcelain. This is raw, unfired porcelain. And uh, right now, incredibly delicate. When you fire it, it shrinks quite a bit, about 12%, and uh, becomes very, very durable. The other thing with our product is just the creativity behind it. We keep our shapes pretty simple. We like nice, clean lines, you know, things that are going to not go out of fashion in a month. But we play around a lot with our finishes, our glazes. And all the production happens here in the city. Yeah, so we make everything here. Uh, we make our clay from raw materials. We make our glazes from raw materials. Uh, we form the pieces. We make the mold, fire it. We do all the things here. We ship it out. So every single piece of pottery that has felt and fat on it has been touched by typically at least 10 people. All the people doing the work here in the studio, um, you know, we hire people from all different backgrounds. We have a lot of you know, people who went to art school like myself. We have people um, who are hired out of the neighborhood. We've worked with a company called Baker Industries that does job training for people who are a little harder to employ for various reasons, so formerly incarcerated, people with housing insecurity, things like that. So we really aim to provide great jobs for people from the neighborhood who really want them and need them. So we really believe in you know, an economy 
that feeds back into itself. We also really believe in collaboration. That's working with other artists, other companies, figuring out how we can manufacture in America in these kind of like rust belt cities that used to be centers for manufacturing. Most people today are used to getting products in their hands. They don't really think much about you know, where it came from, how it was made, who made it, and being able to kind of connect to you know, the people making things, the materials they're being made out of, kind of really hearing the story of you know, how a mug came into your hands. It seems so every day, which it is, but these things you know, come from somewhere. <laughs> and so I think people just respond to that a lot. Well, look who's here. It's Sharon. Hi, Sharon. Hi, Mike. Uh, what is your title? I am the curator of exhibitions here at Perkins Center for the Arts. What is this place? This is a nonprofit, uh, multidisciplinary art center that promotes lifelong learning through the arts. I love the building. You do. What was it? This building uh, in the early 1900s was an automotive factory. Whoa. And you can still what see some of the tracks that they used. Uh, with the with the motor, it had to be one of the first automotive factories Absolutely. in the country. Then. Yeah. It's oh my cool. gosh. Yeah. So the first thing I noticed, besides the outside, is, is really cool looking. The class, the classes that are going on, all the time. Yes. What are the what mediums? All mediums. We have an education department that provides uh, classes in every medium you can uh, imagine. The mediums that we saw here today that they, the students were working in was ceramic. Okay. There's a glass torch class. There's mosaics. There are. There's a sewing class. There's embroidery. Um, there's painting. What if I watercolor? <laughs> what if I don't know how to do any of that? Can I still take class? Yes, you absolutely can. I can learn how to throw something. Yes, you can throw I mean, something I, on the wheel. You could paint. You could do um, anything you want. I'm very much into art. I have a little collection of uh, glass art. Okay. So, glass blowing? Yes. Well, it's torch work. It's here. torch work. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you use a little uh, fire torch to, yeah. to make beads and whatnot. Well, it also looks like you have a gallery, obviously. Yes, we have two, this, two galleries in this Where's location. the art from? The art that's hanging now, um, we have two artists featured. V. Stenta is from Wildwood. Love that. And she works in multimedia collage. And Cheryl Patton Wu behind me is from Cape May. That one too? Yep. Okay. And she works in fabric and thread. Okay. Could I throw a party in here? You sure can. This would be a great space We're for a party. We're having one on Saturday. All right, let's <laughs> plan one, Sharon. Come on. Uh, thank you. Uh, more of the 215 won't come right back. back. Uh, it's now time for a 215 flashback fave. My favorite thing too here is, oh my God, this reminds me of my grandmother's house. And I'm like, that's exactly <laughs> what I wanted when people come in. I'm a black centric thrift store. I specialize in African descendant history and culture of all kinds. I found these at a thrift store. And they are real photographs of Martin Luther King. Everything is just kind of my vibration and what I'm drawn to spiritually and emotionally. I try to show the expanse of African descendant culture and black culture across the diaspora. We definitely have a lot of things that are from Africa, as well as more modern things like vinyl records, R&B, I have James Brown, all the way to rap CDs and cassettes and different things like that. He was missing all his accoutrements, but it's Michael. I like to put things in conversation with each other because there's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. Everything has something that has come before it that has influenced it. So you can look at modern art and still see an ancient African impression. There's also times when I'm, I love something so much that I'm so happy that somebody else loves it too and that they want it and they want to put it in their house. Um, people have bought things and I'm like, oh my God, I'm so happy you're buying this, you know, that this has another, another path to take in life. 
it's really, really important that we preserve our things. A lot of times with black history and ephemera in particular, it's very much lost to us or out of our own possession as black people. And so I do find it to be really important to create a space where people can access um, the culture and, and be able to pass it down through their own families and their own friends. Black soul is for everybody because black history is for everybody. Oh, the show's not quite over. So come on back after the break. That's it for this edition of the 215 from the Perkins Center here in Collingswood. I'm just watching Kathy throw a, is that a pot? It's a vase. It's a vase, a vase is what it is. And I've been trying to talk her into recreating uh, the scene from Ghost. Uh, would you be up for that at all, Kathy? No. No. <laughs> we'll see you next time on the 215.